Good afternoon, everybody in Canaway country and anybody that would like to watch this show. Um, this is a friend to whoever is watching it. It's a friend if you're in, as we've had, Holland, uh, Greece, all over e Europe, in Japan, and of course, the United States, wherever you are and wherever you're coming from. Uh, we are passionate about Canaway Champions because it's about finding the champion in us, which is a daily discipline. It's a daily discipline normally, but it's particularly a daily discipline right now. And a man that I think is a great combination of great success on the field, in this case, track and field, Mark Creer, two-time Olympic uh, medalist, um, hurdler, just an amazing athlete from USC, um, but also a man that has taken those lessons and become a very recognized counselor, particular, particularly in the area of multicultural training, uh, diversity, and how we, I'd like to say, uh, come together as a team. I mean, that's what our challenge is in this country, mm -hmm. because if we can lead in this country, we can lead all over the world. We're going to try to keep it out of politics. It's going to be a challenge, but we're going to do that. And we're going to talk to Mark. Mark, we're just so honored to have you, brother, because uh, not every athlete can speak to these subjects, including physical and emotional abuse, um, the way you can. And uh, we don't want to dwell on them. But we want everybody that's dealing with forms of emotional, even physical abuse, everybody that's dealing with adversity, to get one or two distinctions today that will help change their lives, keep them focused on being the champion, being the best they can be. So, Mark, God bless you. Thank you for being part of the show. Thank you, Nick. I appreciate it. I'm looking forward to the conversation. So, uh, we talked about, I mentioned, um, growing up in a single family um, where... You didn't have a father figure. You had challenges uh, with regard to physical and emotional abuse. Tell us about that. Tell us in the context of what a champion, now looking back, looks back at what happened and how you dealt with it and the important distinctions and decisions you made that helped you rise up past that. Well, that's a good, uh, good question. And, um, you know, I have a saying, out of your misery comes your ministry. And no test, no testimony. And definitely, I think everyone has a testimony because everyone has to go through a test. And I remember going in church in early years, we used to have something called testimony service where people stand up and give their testimony. And then one um, individual walked up to me and said, Mark, well, I don't have a testimony. I come from a, a good family. I never had cancer and survived uh, and they felt a little bit empty but when we say testimony and we say overcoming hurdles it's not just catastrophe or, or devastation it's just the everyday walks in life and we all have our cross to bear mine unfortunately was physically and mentally uh, abusive and growing up young when you're wet cement being, uh, you know, abused, your confidence, your self-esteem was low. And so I didn't believe in myself. I didn't believe in anything for that matter. I was just trying to survive to the next day without getting beat. And for the, all those that are going through that, then I feel your pain and I feel your struggle and you're not alone. And I will say this, Nick, there was always someone that was there and I believe they were sent. Now, whether I acknowledge them or not, whether I was obedient enough or not to receive them, but there was always someone there to give me a hand up, not a hand out, but a hand up during those uh, uh, crucial times. Give us an example of that. Um, uh, when was the time when, what age were you, when at the same time that you were discovering that you weren't just dreaming about being a great athlete on the national mm -hmm. or international stage, but you had a feeling you really did have a chance of that combined with who were the figures, the coaches, the mentors, mm -hmm. they may not have been on the track. They may have been right. somebody that helped you show up at that track. So tell mm -hmm. us about that. Well, that's funny. Here's a story. Now I'm being candid on, on this show. <laughs> I was a late bloomer. I didn't start track and field until I was a senior in high school. And being coming from an abusive childhood, you know, you don't, I didn't have the family support and the finances that, you know, supported, but there was this high school security guard. His name was Frank Jardine. We used yeah. to call him. Yeah. We used to call him narcs back in the day. And he looked at me and I was sitting on the benches and he came up to me and said, you look like you could run track. 
<laughs> and, you know, I'm getting one-legged A's in my grades. You know what a one-legged A is? Yeah, D's in the latter, you know. <laughs> but uh, through the grace of God, I graduated. But <laughs> but he walked up to me, and, and, and like I said to him, I thought to myself, track? The first thing that came up to my mind was girls in shorts. So that's why I went out. I, I, you know, I want to go out there with the girls in the shorts. And it was something that I fell in love with. It was something that the more I worked harder at, the better I became. You know, right. nothing that, something that nothing, nobody could take away from me. You know, no politics, no this. And, you know, so I fell in love with it. And from that senior year, I remember having a double hernia. I mean, a hernia or pulling my bone and, man, I was out. But I had to rehab, rehab. But through the grace of God, I, I, I learned something. I, I learned that, you know, your labor is not in vain. I learned that the harder you work, you will see the fruits of your labor, you know. And I learned at that point, let my faith be greater than anybody else's doubt. And at that point, I just start training and training and training and, 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 and that learned how to overcome those hurdles in life. So it was for Frank Jardine who guided me into running the hurdles at that early age. You know, um, one of the things I'm most proud of, uh, I just found out that I'm nominated for the NFL Hall of Fame again this year, which is great stuff. Congratulations. Um, thank you. And there's a, there's a sports analytics group mm -hmm. that came up with a statistic I'd never known about, which is when you're playing football, the biggest games are the playoffs and at the end of the year. So we're talking mm -hmm. December, January, when mm -hmm. the weather in Kansas City and really anywhere except maybe the West Coast is terrible. Right. And, um, I was not only most accurate kicker in normal weather, I was most accurate kicker ever in the bad weather. I was actually a better kicker in the bad weather. And I think about <laughs> technology, which I didn't know about. I just knew I had to double down on my focus, double down on mm -hmm. seeing myself. And the other part was um, memories of coming back from injuries. The only game I ever missed was in 1992. And uh, the famous artist Leroy Neiman was on the sidelines. I didn't know he was sketching me. And right. I, I may run and get it in a second, but uh, we lost that game. I felt terrible, but I had an extra week off and we had a bye week. Mm -hmm. I came back from that injury, which is a pulled groin. And mm -hmm. uh, people were joking about how I pulled my groin. We just leave it at that. That's what you do. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and I had three field goals, kicked the game winning field goal to beat the uh, San Diego Chargers. Mm -hmm. And it was almost as if the injury helped me appreciate and be even more in the moment, focused, mm -hmm. intense. And so it taught me more and I actually came back better. And when I talk to kids today, I'd love your opinion of this. When I talk to them, especially when they're in the training room and they're injured mm -hmm. and they have a two or three or six month recovery, I say to them, this is the time when you can teach your brain how to work through pain. Mm -hmm. How to work yep. through pain <laughs> will make you that tough person that in the fourth quarter or the last 25 yards of the 120 hurdles or 110 mm -hmm. meter hurdles. Yes. Uh, you know, when you got to push it and you may even have just kind of know you pulled your hand and you still stride it out, cross that last hurdle and get the gold. So tell us about that. Tell us about uh, any insight you'd give to someone that's dealing with, let's say coming back from COVID and having been in the hospital for a few weeks mm -hmm. or having had their family upended because a, a family friend was, was in COVID. Tell us what insight well, you that. When I was, yeah, when I was uh, during my competition, I had something called the four P's, purpose, passion, permission, and progression. And, and the first and most important part, even when you're injured and you're coming through is your purpose, you know, in order to, you got to answer the question why, and people say that, but your purpose and a goal is different. Your purpose is higher. Your purpose gets you out there when we were training in 110 degree weather. I remember when the NBA was on strike and I lived in Santa Clarita, California, Valencia, and it was like 109 out there on the track. And, you know, the guys called me, hey, Mark, why don't we go swim? And, you know, this is when, like, Kobe Ryan used to come over there and train. And he was like, let's go swim. And, yeah, you know, because they had the lockout. And um, I'm thinking, man, I could go hang out with these guys. It, it, but then I had to answer that question, why? If I didn't know why I'm here suffering in 110-degree weather training, yeah. when I maybe I could have did it at 6 p.m., then I would have swerved. You got to keep your focus. We'll talk about my end of zone focus later. But your purpose is answering that question, why? And the funny thing about that is in Atlanta during the Olympic trials, it was 110 degrees. 
So I already prepared my mind to go in that condition. So sometimes you have to answer your question, you know, why am I doing this? And that's your purpose. And the most important one, Nick, is permission. You have to give yourself permission to win, give yourself permission to lose, give permission to fail, give yourself permission to succeed, because success is a process. It's not just overnight. You're going to lose many races or many setbacks before you get to that Super Bowl, if you will. And I think that when you're injured, that would be a good time to appreciate the talent that you had and the talent that you will have again, and, and then some, by sort of having it taken away from you. So give yourself permission to go through all that, you know. Well, I'm already excited to have you on this show. I'll just give you an analogy. Uh, mm -hmm. Harry Wilson was my mm -hmm. uh, teammate on the – football and baseball teams in college. Mm -hmm. He uh, was father to a guy named Russell Wilson. Okay. Okay. Uh, I actually uh, called Harry when he was um, on his deathbed and mm -hmm. Russell, had a phone. this is when he was a senior in college. And um, I didn't know Russell until I met him four years ago in Kansas city. Okay. But what Harry told Russell over and over again, and Russell has said this right after winning the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm is why not you, Russell? Yeah. Why not you? And I think we have yeah. to ask our, ourselves that question. Why not Nick Lowry? Why, why not you? Why yes. Not yes. Why not Kim Nunley, our awesome producer? Why not Lisa Neal? Yes. Our awesome teammate, or Blake mm -hmm. Schrader, or the people in Canaway. Why not us? Why can't we have greatness, especially, exactly. especially if it's linked to a purpose that is bigger than us, that's serving people. Exactly. Oh, yes bringing purpose in a way that makes us feel mm -hmm. connected on this earth for the right mm -hmm. reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, I mean, that is so true, but that's when you're putting it all together. So we got the per permission, we got the uh, purpose and we got the progression and, and the progression is so important, you know, coming from a faith-based background, it says, you know, uh, faith without works is dead. And you can look at all the videos, you can hear all the motivational talks, but you can have the best plan in the world, but it won't work until you do. Okay, so you have to really work the plan. If you work the plan, the plan will work. Yeah, and, and it's hardest to do the work when it's hardest. I mean, to work that <laughs> yeah. when you're injured, when you're sick, when you've got distractions. Mm -hmm. So the other part is when I talk to kids, and I'm saying this because I have a feeling you you are much connected to these messages. I say mm -hmm. to kids, you know, when I see today's players, I talk to them at training camps and in the off season, and they're talking about it's about the, the paper, man, which is the money. And I'm going, it's not about the money. The money will take care of itself and mm -hmm. your uh, career and your experience in sports, guys. And this is all the way down to eight-year-olds on the Little League football. Sure. Whatever, is learning to focus when you're exhausted, and when you're bored, because today's kids are used to instant, not just gratification, instant reward, instant feedback. Yeah. Sometimes you're not getting that feedback, or the feedback yeah. isn't what you want. And you stay, yeah. stay focused because you're teaching your brain, which mm -hmm. is benefit from, yeah. teaching your brain to stay with it longer than anyone else. That's mm -hmm. why the champion team, look at the Chiefs coming back in the fourth quarters, down right. to I know you like that. Uh. <laughs> And then, of course, down 10 points again with just a few minutes left against San mm -hmm. Francisco in the Super Bowl, which then had become a habit. By right, right. Saying they had, knowing they had this edge and faith in each mm -hmm. other, then they knew 10, 10 mm -hmm. points, that's no big deal. They won by 11. Wow. Let me tell you the story real quick since we're going. And then okay. I'll circle around. In 1996, I was at the Summer Atlanta. But two weeks before, I went to USC, but we were training at UCLA. And that's the Crosstown rivalry, if you guys I don't know. Back. And I blame it on Drake Stadium. No. But um, Fred Rogan of ESPN, it's kind of like Eurosports in, in Europe, but it was ESPN. They were doing a coverage because at this time I was ranked number one in the world. Now, picture this. You're number one in the world. Not just the year. Yes. What year were you? 1996. This was the, yeah, the Summer Olympic Games oh. headed towards Atlanta. Um. Fred Rogan and Sports Center wanted to do a, what do you call those pre background stories? So they play it right before your race. So they came in and I had the hurdle set up and I ran 110 meter high hurdles, which are three and a half feet. They come up to your belly button if you're oh, wow. six one. 
Yeah, some people run over him, but I was going over him, right? And um, the cameraman wanted to do a shot where he got up underneath the hurdle and had me go over it. It'd be a nice view. And I said, okay, but I was tired. and I was so focused. I was so in the zone that nothing I did was going to change just because the photographers right. and it were out there. So I said, I'm going to, you know, we run 10, but I put up 12. So I was overtraining. So towards the end, I was fatigued. So yeah. the second to the last hurdle, he was underneath trying to film. And I was boom, boom, boom. And I was focused. I was in the zone. All the things we read about, all the things I talk about. But then my eye kind of caught him. Right. And I said, well, let me look kind of pretty. You know, let me look more stylish, you know, for the camera. And then I went. And then as I was going to snap down, his body was right there. So I would have smashed his head, landed on a camera if I would have came right down on the hurdle. So I extended a little bit. Consequently, my body was twisted. I turned and I broke my left arm because I fell and broke, you know, my radio head, fractured my radio head right here. Now, we're talking about two weeks, Nick, before the Olympic Games. Two weeks, okay? And, and, and also live on television. This was live. So here I am laying on the ground, the camera's in your face. You don't know what you're made of until you're dealt with something, a challenge, when you're dealt with something that can possibly break you. You don't know. It's easy to give advice and encouraging, oh, you'll be okay, you'll recover when you haven't been through anything yourself. But again, no test, no testimony. So two things at this time, Nick, challenged me. What am I going to say? Because when you get hurt, those four little words come out, and they're not love, okay? They're not love words, you know? But they're right there. And i never forget this day. Right there, my arm swelled up a little bit. And then, of course, you know, we rushed myself to first care emergency right there to get it x-rayed. Of course, they came too. So I didn't have time to regroup. I didn't have time to be TV, yeah, TV ready. And so many times, you know, they get you right, you know, right when you cross the finish line, right when you do an interception, right when you miss the field goal. They're right there in your face. But that proves Bill's character building. So I never forget this. The doctor came out and he said, huh, he giggled and said, I'm sorry, you're not running in the Olympics because you got a broken arm. The camera's right there. I wanted to, you know, I want to give him a George Mike Tyson, you know, <laughs> right there. But again, the camera is right there. And I kid you not, two seconds later, I get a call from the USOC, United States Olympic Committee. It was a fourth place person saying, hey, Mark, I'll take your place in the Olympics. I haven't even dealt with this, you know, but they're calling because, you know, he's an alternate. Yeah. But uh, through, through all that, and there's a bigger story that I can share with you later, but let me just share real quick. I get two minutes, right? So then we go through all this, Nick, and then um, I'm just in shock. You know, and I said, well, you know what? Give me some time to think about it. I was sponsored by Nike. They said, hey, we'll honor your contract. We'll give you the bonuses. It's on television. We understand. You know, we, we can make a good st spin on it. You know, could have ran, broke his arm. You know, woody woo, sad story. But I went home and I consulted my, you know, master coach, which is my Lord and Savior, right, God. And, and um, he said, no, you know, you're going to finish it. Finish it. So I said, no, I'm going to compete. Now, here's the twist of this story. I got a phone call, and it was this guy, and we know him around the track field. He said, Mark, we'll get you ready in two weeks. And I'm like, I prayed. I was like, praise God, amen. He said, just come up to Oakland or come up to the Bay Area, and we'll fix you up, and you'll be, your arm will be, you no problem. And I said, cool. I scheduled my flight, and that night I prayed, and this is what I'm saying. You don't know what you're made of until you go through something. Right. And it said, don't go, Nick. It said, Mark, don't go. And I was like, what? It just said, don't go. And I'm like, wait a minute. This is a blessing because, you know, everything that got, comes your way is not good. But I'll summarize it like this. I didn't go. And um, I just had a soft cast. Of course, a year later, this particular, you know, uh, shop was on television. Drugs. Balco. Thank you. If I didn't have that inner, if I didn't listen to that voice, not that I want to win, 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 but I want to do what's right, right, right. Like you said, don't go chase the paper. The paper will come. 
Yes. So you could have shot me in the arm and I was going to go to those Olympics. And, but because I was obedient yeah. and disciplined, I wasn't wrapped up into that, you know, whole Balco. And you might've uh, run a race, but then you would have been. Successful. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And you know, so, we had uh, Butch Reynolds on who was. Yes. Finally, finally, uh, <laughs> you know, exonerated by the Supreme court itself. And yet he's had to deal with that. Yes, cloud. that cloud. I'm you know, glad. Yeah. And, you know, and and it's it's sad to me that you know when we have a a culture where somebody's made an accusation, and mm -hmm. um, even when you exonerate yourself, you no. still get, it takes yeah. a lot of spiritual, intellectual, emotional, and physical power to overcome that and remain in full of integrity. Sure. Who you are. Sure. I mean, man. So it, let me tell you the story. So in '96, after that, yeah. um, so I had a soft cast, and this is for people who have to compete with injuries, or have had injuries, or have had some type of setback. Now, if you don't know track and field, you're in the starting blocks, and that's when they say runners take your mark, and that's a lot of pressure. I couldn't put any pressure because of my arm. And I remember we were in opening ceremonies and this is when the dream team was there and everybody was there. And, and, you know, so I, yeah. What'd you say? Muhammad Ali. Yes, sir. <laughs> and I have my, um, my jacket on and it was covered because I had a soft cast because I didn't, couldn't compete with a hard cast, of course. And people were bumping to me. And I never forget to some guy bumped into me and, um, you know, when you have a fractured arm and they bump into you, it's like, Ch -ch -ch. so, you know, and I was full of myself at the time. I was like, hey, man, watch it, you know? And then as I turned, I kid you not, his belt buckle was to my nose. <laughs> this guy was Alonzo Morning. This dude was huge. He was the basketball player. I said, I'm just playing. I'm sorry. You know, hit it again. You know, but here's the here's the part of inspiration and trying out of your misery comes your ministry part. I remember if you recall a uh, trivia, who lit the torch for the nineteen ninety six Summer Olympic Games? I'll fast forward. Muhammad Ali. Now, he uh Alanda Holyfield handed it to him. And after I got bumped, my arm was throbbing, throbbing, throbbing. I remember Muhammad Ali sitting up there, and he had the torch in his left hand. And if you remember, go back, and 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 and, and they gave it to him. He was just supposed to light it, and he started to shake because of his, you know, um, uh, what's it called, L L yeah, Parkinson. And he was shaking, and he stood there for about at least thirty seconds to a minute, and he was battling with himself, and it was like a connection because. He was trying, and my arm was throbbing, and, 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 and it seemed like I was everybody was rooting for him. You could do it, and Holyfield was standing there, and he thought about taking it, but then Muhammad Ali was like, I got this, and he was like, you know, contemplate, you know, kitty, 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 and, and, and because of his faith, and, and, and when he did that, my arm was throbbing, but when he lit that torch, I said, well, if he could do that, then I could run with this, and at that time, you could have shot me, and I would have still ran. It was very powerful. So you got to pull your your motivation and your encouragement. Yeah, I, I told a story. Uh, Mohammed moved in two doors down from me mm -hmm. years ago. And mm -hmm. I ended up uh, being a sort of like um, unofficial bodyguard for him at a bunch of events. I actually drove him to the NBA All-Star game. And nice. I room with LeBron and the mm -hmm. Yao Ming, everyone. And they're all like little kids. I mean, they're all like little kids with him. Yes. I saw the story, and I, I mentioned before, uh, Dave Moore, the general manager for the, the uh, Royals, two years before okay. went to the World Series. And I like to think this added a little bit. And I drove Mohammed in their white Range Rover with his um, sister-in-law, uh, Marilyn Williams. And uh, they had a big golf cart to take him out, gave him a big Royals jersey with mm -hmm. Ali, number one. Sure, sure. We came through the uh, outfield wall, and people were standing and crying, and it mm. was spectacular. And yes. We had to leave, and, and and the game was great. And I gave him a. Maryland didn't like it because at that point they thought he was lactose intolerant, but it, it was, <laughs> we all is. Yes. He's actually, the carotene in him, uh -huh. so I got a picture of him with a little bit of you know milkshake here. <laughs> 
we had to leave. And as we're coming back towards the car, there are about 25 kids, and, and his Parkinson's medications are wearing off. Mm -hmm. He's tired, and I'm worried. And I, this is such a beautiful expression of exactly what happened in that moment at the 1996 yes. uh, lighting ceremony that you witnessed because suddenly his Parkinson's just stopped. Yes. He stopped shaking and he sat mm -hmm. in that part and kid after kid. Come on now. Yes. Five -year -old sat on his lap and you have never seen, I don't care what religion you are. You no. Care so much angelic just pure love love that's and what a champion is that's a colorway champion <laughs> that's what a champion is it's, it's yes. about it's about finding that way somehow mm -hmm. and also putting others you know realize yes. the power to inspire others so uh i'll post some of these pictures with him in that moment that'll be nice yes i also heard this story as well when he was in ireland because believe it or not Muhammad ali had some irish blood okay well and they, I've got 2% from Congo and Cameroon, thank you. <laughs> right. <laughs> was, uh, they lined the roads in Ireland mm -hmm. for 15 to 20 feet behind on either side, right, for 20 miles. Mm -hmm. And the same thing, he has Parkinson's, he gets out, and he, people giving them their babies to hold, and the same thing. It's just, just a remarkable wow. example of yeah, yeah. Align what really matters. When, as you say, you align mm. your purpose, your passion, your progression, and your permission mm. to be yes. with. And yes. Uh, not yes. too many examples better than Muhammad Ali. No, no, not at all. You know, I know, um, of course, his daughter and Layla and uh, Con Curtis Conway, because we went to SC together and we were uh, we were traveling roommates on on a track team. You know, when he wasn't, you know, running and playing football, but you no. Know, was he a hundred meters or what was Curtis? Yeah, Curtis Conway. Curtis, yeah, he, he was. He, yeah, you don't see too many brothers that look like me doing long distance. Now, come on. <laughs> yeah. No, he was a hundred and two hundred meter specialist. But uh, yeah, he was quick. So that was good times. And 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 I remember. And there's a, a a part of the story that goes on. And this is what I want to convey to everybody about you know, focus and, and, and yeah. finding that, you know, a champion has an itch that they can't scratch. And part of being a champion is being able to give, you know, um, everything, you know, you look any book about success, they say giving is one of the prerequisites of feeling uh, of validated and feeling successful. So even in birth, you give birth, a woman gives birth, and then after that birth, they're in joy, you know, John three sixteen. Whoever gave, you know, he John, Lord gave his son. So you know, the, the, it's the, the spirit of giving. Well, we were in nineteen ninety six again. So we're we're at the semifinals, and all this is fact finding. You can check it out. Nineteen ninety six. Of course, I have a broken arm at this time. NBC and everybody else knew about it. Um, I couldn't really get out of the starting blocks. You know, when they say runners take your mark, boom. I couldn't. Yeah. I was a sprinter, so you need to react fast. But I I, I was kind of leaning like one sided because I couldn't put pressure in my arm. And it was this tall, ugly dude from Germany. I'm just playing. It was a, it was a guy next to, about the Germany part. No, it was this tall guy, and he was to my left. And boom, the gun goes off. And of course, everybody is gone. I'm like uh, the turtle in the snare. I'm just way behind. But you know, proper planning prevents poor performance. So you know, it was muscle memory. I'm going through this, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So I'm catching up. Now I'm in about third place. And this guy reached over and he reached over and he wham, you know, cause you're running the hurdles, you're going like this. And he extended his arm and he hit my arm. Oh my gosh. If you go back and look at the video. Ah! So I went from third place to fourth place. And in the semifinals, I mean, fourth place to fifth place in the semifinals, you have two heats and they take the top four. And I took fifth. You know, he kind of pushed and helped me back. Now, mind you, I'm a silver medalist at this time, so something happened. Again, you don't know what you're made of until you have to go through something. Adversity builds character in a way that no textbook can teach you. So we crossed the finish line, and of course, right in front of my face, you know, I was ranked number one in the world. Mark, you didn't even make it to the finals. How do you feel? So on and so forth. And, 
you know, my, my flesh, my first inclination was like, let me go curse this dude out with my right arm. <laughs> let me give him a left, a little right hook. You know, he cheated. But I just, you know, I just walked away. The good thing about it is United States, um, USA Track and Field, United States Olympic Committee did a protest. They filed a protest. They went back and saw the video and they disqualified him, which he took fourth. So that fifth place, made me elevated me to fourth place and the and the story begins yeah well you know something about loyalty yeah you know the olympic committee realizing they had an obligation and then following yeah. through quickly to do that um maybe a little bit of extra respect for you too so they didn't screw around who knows yeah That's beautiful all right so we just got a few minutes but uh you know look at what you've done with your life since you know uh, i said at the beginning yeah, I apologize. We get on a tangent. Yeah. Oh, great, great. So let's talk about multiculturalism and mm. and helping everyone wherever they come from. We're all part of our, our own tribe, our own clan. Mm -hmm. How do we learn to uh, live in a world and love in a world, respect in a world mm -hmm. where everybody's different? How do we well, not uh, make it, 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 it yeah. something besides how different we are? Let me summarize this because I know we're in time's sake. There's two. There's two emotions that we talk about racial tension. We talk about prejudice, and and in, in the states we're having this, you know, police and riots and protesting and police brutality. There's two emotions that come with what's happening in our world. And, and let me back up first. Diversity, and everybody wants diversity. We're talking about diversity in churches, diversity in work first, diversity in management in NFL. I think we got our first African-American uh, GM, you know, ever, you know. We're talking about diversity, but diversity is something that you can't see, Nick. It's something that you feel. You can have different cultures and different ethnicities in a group and still have racism, systemic, microaggressions, discrimination. Uh, diversity is something you feel. So there's two feelings that create this tension. It's fear and anger. Fear and anger. Now let's take a riot. Let's take the, you know, kneeling on somebody's neck or police brutality. Fear and anger. The African Americans, I'm using this term loosely, but now, you know, everybody, they're, they're angry. Right. Some innocent bystanders are fearful. Let's say the white population that, that aren't prejudiced, they're like, we're ruining and rioting and tearing their buildings down, burning up their stores, uh, being violent in the streets with them. They're fearful. And then the other ones are angry. Now, when you put fear and anger together, what are you going to get? Explosion. That's what we're getting in society. Now, you back up to that with the police. Fear and anger. You know, we are, we're no longer ang angry. We're fearful of being shot. You know, if you're, you know, black man, <laughs> you, know, you're, you know, being shot. And the police are fearful that people are throwing rocks and whatnot. Fear and anger. Fear and anger. And I think in order to dilute the fear and anger, we need to have something, and I call it the three Fs, faith, focus, and forgiveness. And these are my, and I wrote this, that book about this, faith of knowing that this too shall pass and, and believing in something greater than yourself and higher than yourself and more than yourself, you know, and, and, and having the faith that, you know, you're not going through this just to, to, to be a victim. You're going to be a victor. You know, and really pulling on your faith, your confidence, your 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 spiritual, you know, entity. You know, your your, and then focus. You know, is what do we focus on? Are we focused on the past? Are we focused on the present? Are we focused on the the future? Or, you know, getting the zone. I call it not the twilight zone, but that zone where, like I was in the Olympics, or like you were kicking in the snow. It could have been you be kicking on lava, but you still was going to make that kick because you were in such a zone. And then a uh, 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 forgiveness. And forgiveness is the key. Without forgiveness, there is no healing. And I coined something called emotional. Uh, uh, constipation when uh, when you're constipated it hurts you know until you take a laxative but you think of the wounds and the history and the abuse 
Um, why do people break up? Because they have a memory, right? Why do relationships end? Because of the memory of the abuse. And without that proper healing, then there is no let's move forward. You know, so I think the healing and the forgiveness, forgiving of yourself and forgiving of each other and be transparent. I think this movement um, with this millennial is, is, is awesome because it's not a white or black thing. You know, this is a hu humane thing. This is a dignity. This is a hum human issue. And now the millennials the, and the younger, they don't know the hardcore racism that we experienced in our past. So they're looking at, why are you being cruel to this person? And they're the ones that are in an uproar. They're the ones that are protesting. So it's not a black thing. It's not a white thing. It's a, hey, we care about life, period thing. And I think once we start implementing, and there, you, have you heard of this term cognitive dissonance? It's something that, you know, has, has enabled us to go through four years of slavery, go through the Holocaust, go through all these horrific times and somehow not have it affect us. There's something that's called complex trauma. And this is traumatic experiences that if not dealt with, you'll have that emotional constipation. It went over again. Yeah. Well, uh, you're executive director of the Multicultural Competency Training and uh, also associated with the American Association of Christian Counselors or the AACC. Uh, what has that required of you? What is the, the message separate from what you just said? How do we make this a pervasive, intentional uh, growth opportunity for all of us mm -hmm. so we mature as human beings and soul, mm -hmm. if you will? Well, well, I think the first thing is being honest. You, there's something, there's a difference between culturally competent and culturally sensitive. Most people are culturally sensitive, meaning they sympathize, but they're not really culturally competent. They do not understand the different cultures, even within one ethnicity. So let's say African Americans or whites or you know Native Americans or Asians, they all have a culture. They and I, I compare it to food. AACC allows me to present menus, if you will, to the mental health and counseling of of food that will attract certain cultures, stereotyping, if you will. But if you dip it in flour and fry it, that's called fried chicken. And more African-Americans will go towards that type of chicken than if you boil it and put lemon and garlic on it. Or if you put, you know, jalapeno sauce on it, that might, you know, attract more generally speaking. And the same thing with mental health is you have to speak their language and, and, and speak a way that they understand. It, you know, if you have just seen your brother shot, you know, and he has no weapon, and then, you know, you uh, vent and then get, you know, and protest, and then you have to have 52 weeks of anger management because you, you know, were throwing rocks through a window, then you're sitting there with a counselor that looks like the same person that shot your, you know, shot your brother, how are you going to relate? And vice versa, if you're that counselor and somebody who just mugged you or, you know, uh, stolen your purse looks like the guy that you're counseling, you got you need to be culturally educated. So this division that I'm associated with provides resources to counselors, lay counselors, anybody in the help, you know, I want to help field to teach them how to communicate and speak the language of your counselee or whoever you're mentoring to help them uh, because it's about them. It's not about us. It's about those people that are struggling with the issues that um, that need, you know, professional lay counseling, professional counseling, just mentorship. Yeah. I like the fact that, and of course, um, track and field is more of an individual sport, but in, in sport in general, certainly in, in the locker room in the NFL, um, most of the time, I mean, race ain't an issue. I mean, most mm -hmm. of the time, you're teammates, and you will do whatever you need to to that teammate. Mm -hmm. You love them. I'll tell you what, at the uh, alumni events, when I come back and I see my brother, Gary Green, and mm -hmm. you know, uh, some of the great players that I broke in with when I was just yes. mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's just a beautiful thing. Uh, and I, I hope that more and more athletes can translate their experience knowing it is possible for mm -hmm. us to – to not only get along, but, but to thrive as champions mm -hmm. 
off the field and take those lessons about about purpose, which you talked about, and about permission to be great, mm -hmm. permission to overcome a, a childhood, as you did, of abuse. Uh, yeah. It's an honor to spend time with you. How do people get in touch with you? I know there's markcreer.com, M-A-R-K-C-R-E-A-R, -E almost clear, career with an R. Yeah. yeah. Tell us more about your books and, and how people can learn more about you and get in touch with you. Well, you can, you can go to my website, markcareer.com. I just published, uh, produced two books, one on multicultural counseling and the other one on Peace Be Still, how to promote racial reconciliation and healing. Um, the best way is to go to my website or you can go to Amazon, Google Mark Career, and see the books I have. But I just want to thank you, Nick, personally and encourage everybody um, that's listening that, you know, life is about complimenting, not competing. And you, you never compare, I mean, yourself to someone else. I mean, everybody's not going to be a Super Bowl champion. Everybody's not going to be a Hall of Famer, but you can be a champion in your own right. And so many times, I think, even in athletics, you know this, it, in professional sports, we have a saying, don't count someone else's money or somebody else's trophies. Everybody's not going to be a Tom Brady, okay? But you can be the best you you can be. And if you focus on, you know, faith, focus, forgiveness, and giving yourself permission to be the best you you can be, then that's all you can ask for. Well, we'd love to have you on again. You know, uh, yes. we know friend John Neighbor is pretty awesome. Uh, oh, yes. Week, we're going to have a guy named James Malinchak, who's an incredible speaker, but he, mm -hmm. he learned most of his lessons. Listen to this. He learned his lessons maybe even before he started doing it. Here he was in a tiny town in Ohio, and he's writing 250 letters every single week as a basketball wow. to every college coach he can think of with his little clippings. And that's why John Thompson from Georgetown came to this, you know, tiny little town to, you know, recruit this, this awkward, what he would describe as, I was an awkward white guy. But that was <laughs> Awkward as he might have been, had the work and he had something special in him. Yes. Today he works with uh, Joe Theismann and others he mm. in the country because of that work ethic, because he never stops loving being the best person he can be. Sure, and, uh, sure. I just love and really respect how articulate you are. Clearly you have a big yes. heart. And whatever religion you are, uh, spiritual health is absolutely yes. To making it through the tough times and mm -hmm. being the best person you can be. So, mm -hmm. Mark Greer, um, I had just met you, but I love you as a person. Thank Appreciate you. It. Likewise, brother. And I'll be back on the show as soon as you have me. Uh, maybe we'll have a little group of a few guys, a few yeah. all at once. Uh, yeah. Just remember, everybody out there, have a great week. And remember, it's not the brightness of the spotlight on you. It's the intensity of the light within you. Dang. Thank you. Bless you.